Thank you so much. Um, we have been waiting patiently for our third speaker, um, Professor Don Wallace D. Cruz. Um, he'll be talking on cognitive capacities and machine intelligence. Professor D. Cruz. Thank you, Professor Duha, distinguished scholars uh, gathered here. Uh, I want to thank uh, Swami Tatrutananda for inviting me and uh, Professor Nirmali Chakrabarti for organizing this wonderful seminar. <clears throat> um, I'll be reading out a shortened version of my paper, <clears throat> which, which I hope I can cover in 30 minutes. In fact, I'll, I'll wrap it up as soon as possible, because I don't want to keep all of you waiting for too long. <clears throat> the advent of machine learning based AI has largely been received with caution. Deep learning models are yet to demonstrate anything close to human-like general intelligence. <clears throat> Nevertheless, they have received widespread academic attention in lieu of their unprecedented success in a wide range of applications considered cognitive. Such models exemplify the new brain-inspired paradigm in AI and are designed to learn how to recognize faces or respond to natural language queries directly from data by optimizing billions of parameters over millions of examples. The question of whether <clears throat> artificial neural networks can serve as models of our minds is being probed by investigating whether such models <clears throat> share fundamental computational principles with brain functioning. However, it has also been observed that such developments are threatened by the way in which machines fail because they are uncharacteristic of human cognitive errors. In making use of multi-layer activity vectors to learn high dimensional patterns in data, deep learning models are prone to what has been called adversarial examples. For instance, a model that has been trained to reliably classify images of, say, cats, misclassify an image of a cat that has been perturbed by injecting a very small amount of digital noise, unnoticeable to the human eye. The most sophisticated machine learning systems can produce surprisingly odd and appalling errors in perceiving and acting on the world around them. Prevalence of this phenomenon undermines any attempt to utilize artificial neural networks as a kind of model organism for human cognition, or as scientific models that could potentially explain crucial aspects of human cognition. While there has been some philosophical discussions about the nature of deep learning models, uh, a promising strategy has recently emerged from cognitive science to understand the limitations of these models when comparing them with humans. The strategy calls for making a distinction between competence and performance. As competent language users, we understand phrase structure, but due to performance limitations, due to uh, working memory, our linguistic performance takes a hit when we encounter complex sentences. So here's a general proposal given by Firestone. I quote Firestone, the performance competence distinction urges us to consider whether the failure of a system to behave as highly hypothesized or the failure of one creature to behave like another arises not because the system lacks the relevant knowledge or internal capacities, but instance, instead because of superficial constraints on demonstrating that knowledge. Competence is a system's underlying knowledge, the internal rules and states that ultimately explain a given capacity, often in idealized terms. Performance, by contrast, is the application or use of such competences, how the system actually behaves when prompted to express its knowledge. Armed with this distinction, Firestone attempts to show 
how artificial and biological constraints are to be taken into account when evaluating the kind of errors manifested in humans and machines. For instance, when perceiving a scene, various factors like speed and memory in processing information, uniformity of image resolution, availability of classification profiles, and so on, affect humans and machines uh, differently. Hence, it is possible that both have similar internal competences, even if you observe stark differences in how they perform. In this paper, the performance competence distinction is scrutinized to see if we have a well-developed account of competence. Firestone's proposal has different elements, each of which are philosophically loaded. Firstly, there is the equivalence of competence as an internal capacity and that it is supposed to be some form of knowledge. And I think he has knowledge how in mind. But I will not be taking that problem here. Uh, I want to focus on the explanatory role uh, ascribed to competence. If competence is ultimately something that explains a cognitive capacity, how should we understand the explanatory relation that competence partakes in? A few initial remarks are necessary to clarify a terminological ambiguity about Firestone's thesis that competence explains capacity. If one takes competences to mean some form of capacity or power, this claim would have to be interpreted as stating that a competence of some sort explains another competence. I think that Firestone's claim when he says, internal rules and states that explain a given capacity does not mean that the explanants are powers or capacities. Instead of digressing into metaphysical issues, I will restrict my inquiry to the literature and philosophy of cognitive science and look for ideas that illuminate these ideas, issues. So what exactly are competences and cognitive capacities? Firestone thinks of competence as an internal capacity. And if this is supposed to explain a cognitive capacity, perhaps we are better off appealing to the notion of representation in cognitive science. A philosophical theory of representation that suits Firestone's needs is found in Shia's book, Representation in Cognitive Science. The type of representation advocated for by Shia refers to internal components of the nervous system that correlate or correspond structurally with digital features, the environment, and are flexibly exploited in downstream representations in order to robustly perform a task. Shia meets the job description challenge for any account of representation and naturalizes the notion with examples from neuroscience. Competence being internal representations in this sense is also something that is consistent with deep learning research. Describing the principles of deep learning, Bengio, Lacun, and Hinton state, deep learning uses many layers of activity vectors as representations to learn connection strengths that give rise to activity vectors by following the stochastic gradient of an objective function that measures how well the network is performing. Representations of this kind are supposed to explain a model's ability to play games or process natural language. It seems then that competences in Firestone's account are internal representations that explain cognitive phenomena. The latter are the cognitive capacities that we attribute to intelligent agents. While these are attributed to humans at the species level in various de varying degrees, depending on individual differences, state-of-the-art AI models excel only at specific capacities. But for the purposes of understanding competence, we don't have to consider the multitude of capacities. What's more important for evaluating the explanatory role of competence is a general approach grounded in the sciences of the mind that characterizes both competence and the cognitive capacity it's supposed to explain. Specifying with precision the details of a cognitive capacity is not easy. Think of how hard it is to specify the satisfaction conditions for successfully making a sandwich or finding one's way in a city. The frame problem that plagued classical logic-based AI is a testament to this problem of specification and stepwise execution. Even in closed domain formal tasks like playing chess or go, where deep learning models have outsmarted human experts, ask yourself what describes a good chess player. We could come up with an algorithm about the rules of the game, but there's no principled way to capture how a grandmaster can take advantage of the opponent's psychological quirks, what distracts or annoys the opponent, play chess for fun, or play variations of the game with made up rules. We don't have an algorithmic grip on the kind of flexibility in such cases. Deep learning models and the connections paradigm that preceded it fares better, at least in principle. Train a network to learn a cognitive capacity without any prior specification of the task. 
with abundant training data and learning techniques, the AI model solves the problem, so to speak. But difficulties in specifying the capacity need not be a bottleneck. We can adopt the following pragmatic methodology for understanding what the explanator is in our analysis of how competence explains cognitive capacity. Take the description of the cognitive capacity to be extensionally roughly equivalent to a wide but not precisely specifiable collection of possible stimulus or task conditions, namely those to which the cognitive capacity would ordinarily be attributed by cognitive scientists. What about specifying competence in terms of internal representations? We have to keep in mind that there is nothing as a competence simpliciter. The competence is always understood with respect to the cognitive capacity that is to be explained. The capacity, the competence mechanism identified must describe the relevant internal components of the brain and the nervous system and not any background conditions that may fall under the general conditions necessary for the system to sustain the capacity. An extensive literature on representations in cognitive science is available and hence here I will choose only one family of theories um, for characterizing representations that align with Shia's account. This is the mechanistic approach in cognitive science according to which a cognitive phenomenon cannot be understood independently of the empirical details of neural implementation relevant to the phenomenon. The intellectual aims of this approach are to be are to understand how representation facts constitutively manifest higher level cognitive capacities. Before we tackle the explanation problem, some discussion on competences as representations of neural mechanisms is needed. Neural representations in cognitive neuroscience are often complex, take on hierarchical forms, and a close examination of research practices reveal that depending on research goals, technology, and the depth of understanding needed, Neuroscientists provide broad causal relations found in mechanisms that may just lay out a sketch with black boxes to be investigated further. <laughs> Identifying internal representations underlying a cognitive capacity is not necessarily a reductionist move. The aim is to reveal cognitive functioning at multiple levels and integrate them in a way that is illuminating. We can adopt a pragmatic view of representations uh, bottoming out since there is no commitment to an ultimate ground level. The question about what level of description is adequate is settled by the ability of the representation to answer why questions about the phenomenon under investigation. The idea is that what happens in the system when a capacity is manifested reliably is what the system is equipped to embody in adaptive interactions with the environment. We may pause here to consider whether the explanants, that is competences, are mechanisms in a physical sense or whether they are uh, to be understood more abstractly. Mars three levels, computational, algorithmic, and implementation, and mechanisms in cognitive neuroscience are typically pegged at the implementation level. But since the algorithmic level is not entirely independent of this level, some take both these levels to be the domain of mechanistic models. Moreover, in the functional analysis program, a cognitive phenomenon is explained by appealing to its interacting subcomponent modules, characterized functionally, that bring about the phenomenon. More recently, integration of implementation level with algorithmic and even computational elements have been proposed. To be consistent with all these diverse conceptions, I will refer to the explanation simply as representation mechanisms. One of the earliest definitions of what a representation mechanism is was provided by Glennon, who states a mechanism for a behavior is a complex system that produces the behavior by the interaction of a number of parts. Macomer, Darder, Darden, and Craver define mechanisms as entities and activities organized such that they are productive of regular changes from start or setup to finish or termination conditions. Craver then builds on this account by postulating a mechanism to be a set of entities and activities organized such that they exhibit the phenomenon to be explained. The organization and inter interaction among components extend beyond causality and include spatial and temporal facts. These mechanistic details increase in complexity when we consider indeterministic processes or non-sequential uh, mechanisms that involve feedback loops. So how do competences constitutively explain cognitive capacities. In Craver's account, what is unique about the kind of explanation existing 
between the explanants and the explanandum is that it's an interlevel affair where levels of mechanisms are levels of composition. But the composition relation is not at base, spatial, or material. To further clarify this relation, Craver provides um, a criterion called the criterion for constitutive relevance. I quote, CR is a component of a component. Uh, a component is relevant to the behavior of a mechanism as a whole when one can wiggle the behavior of the whole by wiggling the behavior of the component and one can wiggle the behavior of the component by wiggling the behavior as a whole. The two are related as part to whole and they are mutually manipulable. CR is a conjunction of two claims. The first says that the phenomenon and mechanism are related as part and whole. The second part of CR is the mutual manipulability criteria, MM, which informs us of the interlevel behavior between the manifested capacity and its representation mechanism. MM is symmetrical. Changing the whole affects the parts and changing the parts affects the whole. Craver's intuition seems to be that knowing that a neuroscientific model satisfies the mutual manipulability criterion is sufficient to conclude that representation is constitutively relevant for the phenomena. For example, when performing some psychological experiment on perception, we take observer reports along with information about stimulus and task description to infer some cognitive process and use brain activity recording devices like fMRI to observe neural activity. While MM is used to identify mechanisms that are relevant to the phenomenon being studied, settling on the optimal design elements of the representations requires judgments on the part of the researchers. Craver states that these judgments of normality are grounded in the judgment or interests of an observer. Some might include cell membrane potentials, uh, others might be interested in computational functions. But this perspectival view does not make explanations agent relative since specified mechanisms must adhere to interventional norms. This approach is integrated uh, into what is called constitutive or compositional explanation by taking into account the way in which mechanism representation facts are selected for functions that are relevant to the phenomenon. Consider the case of describing the function of the heart. This is done in, the, in a contextual manner when we say that it circulates blood in our body or that it supplies oxygen and nutrients to various other organs. When we describe its anatomical structure and show its parts are organized such that it contracts and expands, we are giving a mechanistic explanation of the phenomenon of pumping blood that is necessary for the contextually defined functions. The contextual functions refer to other organs or system-wide structures other than the heart. The mechanism makes no implicit reference to the functional context in which the heart's phenomenon of pumping blood is embedded. Contextual functions describe the role played by the phenomenon understood from a wider system level perspective. So there are three aspects to this model, constitutive, etiological, and contextual. The etiological aspect tells us how the phenomenon came to be, answering questions like, what are the historical processes that led to the uh, capacity being instantiated? The constitutive aspect looks downward or opens the black box into the internal mechanisms to reveal the details at the lower level. And finally, the contextual aspect uh, is upward looking, and situates the phenomenon in a causal network at a higher level where system wide components are implicated. And when all three aspects are in place, we get uh, an explanation of the phenomenon. What is the implication of such a model um, to understand? Firestone's claim that competence explains capacity. In his proposal, the most straightforward interpretation of the explanation sought for is that it is of this constitutive kind. The internal representations at the subpersonal level are responsible for bringing about the manifestation of the capacity. Does the etiological aspect have any relevance? We might describe the antecedent conditions that led to the system possessing the cognitive capacity but does that in any way mark competence? It may even be possible to trace the causal history of the development of the competence from the etiological aspect, but this is beside the point. We could very well have an answer to why competences exist without knowing how it explains the manifestation of the capacity. The case of the contextual aspect is different since the explanatory role performed when looking upward and situating the cognitive capacity in a system-wide sense is to be understood in terms of functions, the function of the cognitive capacity at the behavioral level. 
functional analysis of this kind was first suggested by Cummins, who stated that to ascribe a function to something is to ascribe a capacity to it that is singled out by its role in an analysis of some higher level capacity in a containing system. Notice that function ascription is a way to identify the capacity that could be used to analyze system performance. For example, we might say that the function of recognizing faces or perceiving the local environment is successful ta task performance of various sorts. It could be belief formation, navigation, reasoning and planning, etc. However, the direction of explanation, assuming that we have the ingredients for one, is from capacities to system performance, whereas the proposal we are considering competences are supposed to explain cognitive capacities. In the functional context, capacities are explanandum candidates. In Craver's account, contextual functions play a role in individuating the cognitive capacity so that appropriate interlevel experiments can be conducted to discover mechanisms, according to MM. And the explanatory weight is therefore lifted by the constitutive aspect. And it is this aspect that requires evaluation to understand whether competences explain capacities. However, there is a problem in this approach. If we are to show that cognitive capacities are explained by competences using the resources of cognitive neuroscience and a theoretical framework like the one provided by Craver, what explanatory principle do we appeal to? The principle did demonstrate why mechanism representation explains cognitive capacity is the criterion of constitutive relevance. Craver formulated the criterion as a way to explicate how the mechanism representation parts and the system as a whole manifesting the phenomenon are related. The explication is governed by MM to present constitutive relevance as a sufficient condition for understanding how the mechanism representation explains the phenomenon. Craver says that MM is based on Woodward's notion of intervention. But in what way are we supposed to understand Woodwardian interventions when explaining capacities? Woodward offers a functional account that can be used to provide causal explanations. And causation is an intra-level affair. It is true that Woodward makes use of the idea of difference making when characterizing causal relations, but such causal relations are only to be found in the mechanism identified as explanats. Interventions are used to individuate the mechanistic parts and their activities. So the causal explanation thus occurs at some level and we might call them horizontal explanations, whereas what we are looking for are vertical explanations. It is worth emphasizing that Craver is unambiguous on the relation between mechanism and the cognitive phenomenon being non-causal. He says one ought not to say that things at different levels causally interact with one another. If the explanatory relation between competence and capacity is interlevel, then how would appeal to Woodwardian interventions make sense? And if Craver is aware that the determination relation is indeed non-causal, what is the explanatory role of the uh, symmetrical relation established by MM? The answer appears to be that constitutive relevance captures identifying features of parts and wholes. The difference making referred to by MM does not imply a causal relationship and is supposed to illustrate the non-causal constitutive aspect. MM functions like an operational definition of constitutive relevance rather than an explication of what makes the relation between representation and capacity explanatory. MM is then an epistemic condition telling us that when part whole relations obtain, MM is satisfied. Occurrence of MM between A and B is evidence that A and B stand out in a part whole relation. One might even attempt to defend the possibility that MM is a necessary condition for the explanation relation. Some have argued that without a metaphysical theory of constitution, Craver's account risks being explanatorily hollow. But I think this fails to be a fair critique of compositional explanation. If difference making counts as explanatorily sufficient, uh, we would have to read Craver to be telling us that phenomenon explains the mechanism representation parts and each part of the representation explains the phenomenon. It would be uncharitable to assume that Craver intended such an explication. It is more reasonable to take the explication as a way of relating the phenomenon, which is the whole, and the parts, which are the uh, representation mechanism using uh, this criteria called MM. We should be careful about interpreting the mutual manipulability criterion. It is not playing an explanatory role, 
but rather a confirmatory one. The interventional explanatory criterion comes into play in the etiological and contextual aspects where causal explanations are to be found. But this also means that we are yet to be told what makes the compositional ex aspect explanatory. What then is the explanatory criterion for such an explanation? I think Claver's account is best appreciated as a model of scientific explanation. Scientists, especially in the life sciences, explain phenomena by describing its constituent parts. So instead of answering how, why questions, which would be applicable to causal processes identified in the mechanism, a constitution, uh, Claver's constitutive aspect of explanation answers how questions. If mechanism representation explains the cognitive capacity in virtue of answering how questions, we have to understand the explanatory value of competences in a similar manner. A cognitive capacity is compositionally explained by, com by competence in virtue of the activities of the parts of the representation constituting the competence. Whether the com compositional explanation of cognitive capacities in terms of competence is acceptable depends on how we make use of the competence performance distinction. In using the distinction to account for errors in performance, Firestone advocates for paying attention to performance constraints in both humans and machines, since it is possible that superficial differences in performance may hide deep similarities in competence. The other possibility is also important. Superficial differences may indeed be because of competence dissimilarities. If these possibilities are to be entertained meaningfully to judge whether machines have cognitive capacities, we should ask if competences are linked beyond cognitive capacities to performances. Troublesome philosophical questions about transitivity arise if we claim that performances occur because of cognitive capacities and competences explain cognitive capacities. A more parsimonious move is to extend the explanatory scope of competences to performances. After all, it seems that the performance competence distinction can be pitched in terms of explanatory asymmetry. My linguistic utterances are correct because of my competence as a language user. I performed well in tennis because of my competence in playing tennis. Unless I possess the relevant competence, it seems task performance cannot be attributed to me. In Craver's account, the competence performance link is subsumed within the contextual aspect. But as discussed, Contextual functions play only an individuating role with respect to capacities, and it is not clear how mechanism representations and performances are explanatory linked. Since our present discussion is about systems that are not restrained by classical computationalism, and the specification problem for cognitive capacities exist, it would be a worthwhile exercise to explore whether competences explain performances and model the explanatory norms of a positive account. Does Craver's theory have the resources to guide this investigation? One strategy would be to dis dissect the functions enrolled at the system level in the contextual aspect of such explanations. Although Craver does not consider the nature of norms that are involved in the contextual aspect, a case can be made for epistemic norms being implicated when contextual functions are specified based on what we know of the system's higher level organization and behavior. Take the case of perception. What role would perception play in the organism's overall functioning when it performs tasks in the environment? For success in most tasks, accuracy of content is necessary since awareness of the target state of affairs is crucial for many higher level activities. So the contextual function, at least in the case of perceptual cognition, is defined in a way that the cognitive system attains accurate contact with the world. To meet this epistemic end, an explanatory story needs to be told about how the accuracy of cognitive content is related to other phenomena like action, which co-ops accuracy for successful task performance. Milner and Goodale's two, two visual system hypothesis can be taken as an example where representation underlying visual content are connected to action processing mechanisms. Although there is much debate on the extent of this influence, there is evidence to suggest that sometimes perceptual states are linked to action, which are in turn connected to memory processes. In providing a compositional explanation, models of cognitive neuroscience can be seen to take a design stance, that the capacity and its mechanism representation fit into the larger design of the system that is understood to be accurate or performing 
overall behavior in an optimal or rational fashion, or in some normatively evaluable state. Compositional explanations carry over norms involved in such evaluations. It would require philosophical argumentation to show that these norms are indeed uh, explanatory as opposed to evidentiary. But there is a greater challenge facing any account that takes uh, performance into account. When speaking of successful performances as good or correct, we are committed to the existence of ep epistemic constraints. What should worry any naturalistic program engaged in positing ex explanatory competences is not the identification of these norms, but the rational constraint for mechanism representations. The fundamental assumption behind a rational constraint is that where epistemic constraints are being satisfied, the underlying process is inferential, whether conscious or not. <clears throat> if this is true, then explanations appealing to competences as mechanism representations fail to explain either competences or performances unless the competence instantiates a rationale of some sort. A chess playing algorithm is a rationale for the moves it, for the moves generated. The rules would explain why a certain move is correct. In classical computationalism, rationals would be unbounded under idealization away from resource constraints. Integrating rational principles with cognitive architectures is required for understanding bounded cognition and building machine intelligence. So when it comes to explaining human performances or cognitive abilities using cognitive neuroscience or attributing cognitive capacities to machine learning models, unless we have an idea of how the underlying representations could guarantee in some way that the epistemic constraints of performance are satisfied, we have no way of ruling out that the system is genuinely cognitive. Proponents of artificial of the artificial intelligence approach to cognitive capacities may point at deep learning architecture to reject the truth of the rational constraint. They may proceed with explanatory endeavors by appealing to representation vectors in these models and, and make use of something along the lines of constitutive relevance to demonstrate the part whole composition. However, this would merely reinforce the objection against current machine learning models that they are mere correlation engines. It is conceivable that rationals can be instantiated over activation vectors and weight matrices, thereby differing from the mathematical, linguistically formulated, or symbolically expressed rationals that are familiar to cognitive scientists. And here I'm referring to the classical computational paradigm. Maybe with the discovery of such rationals, we will be in a better position to understand how competence explains cognitive capacity. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor D. Cruz. I think um, not only did you provide a really intense understanding of cognitive competence uh, using a theory of representation, mostly at the neural level, um, with the full awareness that this is not an easy task. Um, you have provided a lot of material for thought to the epistemologist and philosopher of science as well. Really intense paper. I hope there are a few questions. Uh, we will invite questions, a few questions for both Professor Deshpande's paper and Professor De Cruz's paper. Please mention who the question is for. To Professor De Cruz. Okay. People self correct both people self correct both rules and meta rules. Um, has anyone tried a genetic algorithm to tune AIs to people's minds by Turing tests? Can you repeat the last part? Have have researchers tried um, genetic uh, algorithms to like um, to tune AIs to people's minds? by Turing this. A genetic algorithm is, you know, it um, like it not only um, corrects its um, like it, it not only adjusts its um, function but adjusts its own algorithm. True. Now uh, I mean are you asking whether such algorithms capture any facet of how humans use these meta rules? 
Um, see, any, uh, uh, let, let's take the reinforcement learning or self-supervised learning, which was used in um, AlphaGo. Uh, do you think the way such models learn mimic or um, tell us anything about how humans reason? I don't think so. No, see, if you are to point to a, a genetic algorithm and, and, and show what the rationale is, uh, you, you would have to go beyond um, the learning paradigm, right? So, so I can actually tell you, well, this is how you learn from data. And that, you know, AI scientists will tell you. But what has it learned? So, so that's where you would identify the cognitive capacity as. So let's say when you, uh, when OpenAI is uh, designing chatbots, ChatGPT, chat or whatever, um, what, what is intelligible is algorithms like this, which tell you how to learn. And, and they are not constrained by learning, uh, learning constraints. So, so I mentioned about uh, performance constraints. There are also learning constraints. Now, why would uh, AI be uh, AI researchers be worried about learning constraints in the way humans are. But let's set, set that aside for a moment. So once you have a, a, a learning algorithm, uh, what does the system actually learn? Now, what I've presented here is to say, look, if, if you take something like a compositional explanation, uh, adopt it from Craver or any such uh, family of uh, theories, it's easy to ascribe a, a performance, uh, sorry, a, a competence. But, but intuitively we know that these systems are not intelligent, right? So, so you, you need a way to say, look, in spite of compositional explanations holding, uh, there's something else that is needed to show why they are cognitive. So simply getting good answers from a chatbot doesn't count as intelligent, why? Uh, you, you need to so, show, but, it's it's not merely some representations. I mean, you can that, that's an easy task. You can always point to some neural activity happening in the brain, but that's that's not giving you a good explanation. But the so-called rationales, which which I've alluded to, uh, I don't know what they are. Um, I've merely stated that they are not of the kind that you might think of as these rules or meta rules. I mean, if they are linguistically formulated in some way, you might say, well, that's how we do it. But um, show me how it is instantiated in these uh, deep learning models. I have no clue what it is. Uh, can we can we have time for some other questions as well, if you don't mind? Sure. Um, any other questions? Yes. You have asked someone else. Yes, uh, yeah, I, me. Can, I, can I come back to you? Of course, because the mic came to me. Yeah, sure. Hello, Professor. Um, be it either the classical or the novel algorithmic techniques of artificial intelligence, is the human computer interface always such like that? the performance of the human user uh, always instigates the computer to go for a better competence to challenge the user? Um, I don't know what you mean by human computer interface. Um, a, a, a model might learn from humans performing, yes, yes. right? Uh, right, no, but, but the, the, in the classical, so in the 1990s program, um, which, which beat uh, the chess champion mm -hmm. of the 90s, uh, it, it was not a learning program, right? It was a classical, what we know as the chess engines that you might, you know, uh, play on your computer. But deep learning, we are not told any rules, right? So, so when it learns, we know that they are learning something. We can actually point and say, look, this is what happens inside the uh, model. And that's, that's what Bengio, Lekun and uh, Intern are referring to as the internal representations. That's also fine. We can use those representations in different architectures. So, for example, the generative models that we are using, the transformer-based models. 
it, I mean, it's not mere randomization. So if you have, if you look at the transformer architecture, it's not mere randomization, right? So, so there's this simple idea of deep learning where you have an input layer and there are some hidden layers and an output layer. But, but we have different architectures. So the example I've, I'm uh, referring to is the transformer architecture, which is not merely a simple uh, uh, feed forward network. So uh, does it learn something? Yes, it's, it, it always learns something. We, 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 do we want to say that they learn rules? I mean, then we'll, we'd like to know what rules they are. But, but we have no idea what those rules are. Uh, Professor Menon? I'm sure we can discuss this later. Or because of paucity of time, uh, but maybe I'll just mention this thought and leave it at there and we can always discuss. And it is not going to be a technical question, but considering the audience is more or less not in computational sciences, uh, why do you think that there was a lot of discussion when Lamoy came and talked about uh, LAMDA? And uh, as you might be knowing, he was put in leave and then later dismissed by Google but then OpenAI's chat GPT came, everybody has welcomed, and uh, there's a lot of talk about how uh, people will be no more relevant considering the amount of work chat GPT can uh, do and uh, how best an answering machine it is. So how do you think in simple language, what is the difference between OpenAI's open AI, Chat GPT and Google's LAMDA in terms of answering, both being language crunching entities. I, I, I don't know the difference between Google and OpenAI chatbots. Uh, but what I can say is if we look at the way they perform, right? And if you want to say well, there's a difference in performance, you can uh, appeal to the now vast uh, resources that are that are being compiled of how these models go wrong and and it's it's no different from what we've seen in um, uh, image models so the earlier image models you give a, a picture of a cat and it misclassifies this also does the same it's, it's just in the form of language queries so one of the first queries that i put to chat gpt was count the number of sentences in this sentence and it went wrong, right? So again, these are simple errors which humans don't commit. And the obvious temptation is to say, well, they don't have the kind of competences. <laughs> but but if you take this idea of internal representations, you you can. It's possible to give uh, and attribute uh, competences to these models. And uh, my attempt has been to show, well, we, sh we should be more careful because. Clearly, these models don't have competence, and and I've sort of suggested how should how is it that we can go ahead and critique these models and say that look, yeah here's why these models don't have competence. Other than that, um, I, again, I don't think that appealing to technical details are necessary here, and that's why I don't go into details about um, Google's Lambda or um, ChatGPT's uh, OpenAI's ChatGPT. But maybe if I've um, missed something more specific in your question, then perhaps um, we'll take it up later. Yes. I think that would be the last question. Yes, thank you so much, Professor Despande. In your paper, you referred to well being, how Natya Sastra is concerned with well being. It is in that sense, to take that further, what would be the relationship between Natya Sastra and the challenge of a Loko Sangraha? A Loko Sangraha that Bhagavad Gita talks about. And talking about emotion, what are the ethical and the aesthetic dimension of emotions? Because how do we cultivate emotions in such a way so that we are able to take part in the creativity of Loko Sangraha, which contributes to not only the maintenance of the world, but also to its evolutionary transformation. Um, 
I mean, it's a very long question and I don't know the proper answer, but I think uh, if I get you right, it's uh, you are asking about the well-being. Uh, Natya Shastra as an, uh, I mean, ultimately looks at the well-being of, uh, I mean, humankind. Now, my, my contention was to read Natya Shastra in the light of Purushartha theory and therefore I uh, I, I use that expression because uh, you know fulfillment of Purushartha ultimately leads to the the good of life or in simple terms like well-being and so on. So that is the that is how I saw the connection between uh, this uh, Natya Shastra uh, understanding of emotions in the light of uh, well-being or in the light of Purusha. And about this Loka Sangra thing, I, I don't have any answer right now. Thank you. Uh, with that, we conclude this session. And though it is the end of the day, I feel completely fresh. Thank you, everybody.